Graduate School of Business. Her foundational education includes a bachelor's degree in mathematics and economics from Dartmouth College. Dr. Fergale's research has been published in multiple scholarly journals. She has also worked as a management consultant for companies in the automotive and financial services industry, focusing on corporate strategies and change management. She is on a mission to help others work, lead, and live better by understanding and applying the science of people. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Allison Fergale. I always love applause at the beginning, and then I think no matter what happens, you cannot take it back. So I'm really, really happy to be here. I'll give you just a, uh, after that lovely introduction, just a brief story of how I came to be here in the first place. Um, I have been doing general officer training for the Army and the Air Force for about 15 years, starting in the area of negotiation, which is an area where I teach and research. And then a few years after that, there was a request from the leaders of those programs that they wanted to bring ethics in some way, shape, or form into the curriculum, but from a different angle. And I'm a psychologist, and I also study power. And as part of that conversation, I said, well, I have very little to say about what people should do, but as a psychologist, we actually understand a lot about why people do what they do including the things they should not do. So why don't we talk about that? And so that's what I started doing. So the session that you're gonna to see today is a session that I have been delivering, as I said, to generals for 10, 12 years. And a consistent piece of feedback when we have these dialogues and conversations in those groups always comes back, which is, this is really interesting, but why are we only seeing this at this point of our career now? We should see it sooner. And so that was the context in which I got this invitation to come here, which I am very grateful for and very excited about. And so what I'm going to be talking about is a, a, a version of the session um, that I present in those programs, talking about the psychology of power. So if we look here, uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of a quiz. Okay, we see three corporate logos on the screen. We see Volkswagen, we see Enron, we see Wells Fargo, okay? Audience participation moment. Tell me what do these three organizations have in common that ends them up on the same PowerPoint slide? Yes, okay, some scandals, some, some um, wrongdoings, et cetera. Okay, that's right. Now, you can see there's a blank corner there, and these three corporate logos were not the only ones that I could put on that slide. They just happened to be three that occurred to me that were top of mind when I was making it. And so we know that other um, organizations could, could fit among them not just things that have happened in the past, but perhaps things that have, haven't yet happened, things that could happen in the future. And so the slide that we would never want to be able to create is a slide that looks like that, right? It's like an ugly slide, so we'll take it away, all right? But the reason that I start with these three organizations is they have something in common with each other and something in common with the Air Force. These three organizations, if you look at what industries these are from, energy, financial services, um, and automotive. Those are three very heavily regulated industries. There are a lot of rules and regulations. As a result, there are a lot of formal ethics and compliance programs in those industries and in those companies designed to make sure that people do the right thing and not the wrong thing. And yet in those organizations where you have a lot of rules and regulations and a lot of programs that are st stood up to make sure people follow the rules, you have some of the greatest examples of rule breaking that we see. And so as a psychologist, I can understand why that is so predictable. People cannot do the right thing if they do not know what the right thing is. So ethics and compliance programs are absolutely 100% necessary to ensure that we are getting human beings to behave in the best way possible. But they are generally not sufficient, that simply standing them up often doesn't solve the problems we hope they will because of the psychological forces that affect human beings and that's the space that I'm in, the space that I'm, st I'm studying, and, and what I want to talk to you about. So to give you another, one of my favorite and somewhat humorous examples of the forces that shape our behavior, there is a great paper written, you would have no reason to read it, but I'll tell you about it, and the title of the paper is, Do Ethicists Steal More Books? What these researchers did was they went and they surveyed libraries, okay? 
And they said, give us a list of all the books that have gone missing, meaning they've been checked out, but no one has returned them yet. And you don't think anyone ever will. And they divided the books into two categories, the general like, main books, and then a specific category of what they called obscure ethics books, books that would only be of interest to ethics scholars and professors. And the logic was, what they were wondering was, look, who thinks about ethics all day long? They said, well, many people probably do, but certainly ethicists, people who study and profess ethics, probably have to think about ethics all day long. Well, does that make them more ethical? Let's find out. And so they looked at which books were more likely to go missing. And what they found was that the books checked out by the ethics professors were 50 to 150% more likely to go missing than all of the other books. All right? So no, being an ethics professor does not necessarily make you more ethical. But the more fundamental point is that consciously thinking about doing the right thing doesn't always produce the behavior you think it will. Again, back to the psychological forces that shape behavior. So let's start to talk about this. I got another quiz for you. I've got three pictures here. Um, the one at the top is intended to depict alcohol. That's pretty obvious. And then um, on the left, we have my depiction of power. And on the right with the laptop, we have my depict depiction of anonymity. Alcohol, power, anonymity, they all have something in common. Any guesses as to what it is? Thank you. Okay. Alcohol, power, and anonymity, they all disinhibit. They remove the filter um, or the guard that keeps some of the things that we might think or want to do on the inside from being shown to the world. They are disinhibitors. They operate in the brain in different ways, but they have similar kinds of effects. Now, I have very little to say about alcohol, or I, I can say a little bit about anonymity, but I'm really here to talk about power. What is the effect of power on how we behave, and how does understanding it set us up for greater success in our own leadership? So I'm gonna start talking about the good, and then I'll talk about mainly, mainly the bad, the cautionary tale. Okay, so when we, when we think about power, one of the places we have to start is the, is the idea of a hierarchy. Every single organization, military or civilian of any kind, has a hierarchy. There's a reason for that, it's not an accident. Hierarchies do very, uh, several good things for us, and they're, they're listed here. I'm not gonna talk about all of them, but I am gonna talk about one of them. There's reasons why it helps human beings to complete tasks by organizing themselves in a hierarchical manner. All right, so I'm gonna talk about task accomplishment. All right, so what I want you to do for me is I want you to look at your dominant hand, whatever hand you write with, turn it in toward you, and I want, to look at how, I want you to look at how long your fingers are. In particular, I want you to look at your pointer finger, and I want you to look at your ring finger. And I want you to look at them, and I want you to look at, just make a note of which one is longer. Now, if you haven't done this or you're not familiar, there is a measurement that is known as the 2D-4D ratio. It is the measurement of the, of the length of these two fingers, okay? 2D is your pointer finger, second digit, 4D is your ring finger. 2D-4D ratio is a measure of prenatal testosterone, okay? So when you were a fetus in your mother's womb, you were exposed to testosterone. Um, that testosterone is different than circulating testosterone, but they have similar effects on behavior in terms of dominance behavior, power attainment, et cetera. And um, prenatal testosterone affects the length of your fingers, the 2D, 4D ratio. So if you have a relatively long ring finger, your ring finger is longer than your pointer finger. So raise your hand if that's you. My ring finger is longer than my pointer finger. Okay, you can put your hand up. That's indicative of relatively high in utero testosterone exposure. You had a lot of testosterone exposure in your mother's womb. Raise your hand if, like me, your pointer finger is longer than your ring finger. And if they're the same, you can vote in that category too. All right, same or, all right. So if you have a longer pointer finger, you have less testosterone exposure. All right, so what does this have to do um, with anything? Well, it turns out, right, because um, uh, this is a measure of testosterone, and testosterone does affect power attainment. Higher testosterone is associated with um, achieving greater positions of power, more dominant behavior, et cetera. So, um, it, and, and this is, um, I'm going to tell you a study about it, but before I even do that, the 2D40 ratio has been um, shown to predict a lot of things, uh, including 
uh, in a study that was actually forwarded to me by um, one of my friends in the Air Force, uh, the likelihood of having an affair. So longer ring finger, statistically more likely to cheat, at which point everyone puts their hand back in their pocket. But <laughs> that is beside the point for what I'm about to tell you. The 2D40 ratio in this study was used for a much more benign purpose. It was used to, to measure task accomplishments, okay? So what, um, what researchers did was they brought groups of strangers together. And they said, you're going to work in groups to complete some tasks. But the groups were formed based on the finger measurements, unbeknownst to the participants. So they created three different kinds of groups. They created groups that had all um, short ring fingers, like me. So those are people lower testosterone exposure, maybe more likely to behave in less dominant ways, more submissive ways. They created groups of people with all long ring fingers, more dominant. And then they created these mixed groups where some people had the long ring fingers, some people short. And they gave them all these tasks to complete. And what did they find? They found that the groups that were differentiated in prenatal testosterone did better jobs at all the tasks they were given. Why? The, the argument was that those groups were more naturally able to form a hierarchy where some people wanted to take the lead, other people wanted to follow, and the more quickly they could organize themselves in a hierarchical fashion, the better they could start completing their tasks. This is one of many, many, many studies that demonstrates that hierarchy facilitates task performance. The only reason I picked this one is it's by far the weirdest. And if I didn't tell you today, you'd go your whole life without knowing that. But the general finding is supported in all kinds of studies. Hierarchy helps us get stuff done, which means that it is a natural and an important part of our organizational functioning. It also the case that when you feel more powerful, you feel more in control, you will, your behavior will improve to your advantage in several ways, like these things that I've listed here. It's also the case, if anyone likes the maddening game of golf, feeling more in control turns out to be really good for golfers' golf games. When they had golfers before they played around, simply think about a time in their life where they had been in charge, those golfers actually had better rounds. Specifically, they, were, they sank more putts. So feeling like you're in charge, being in a hierarchy, these are actually good things that we are not going to, to get rid of. But there is this downside, which we've all observed, but I want to help you explain why you've seen the things you've seen. So raise your hand if, you've, if you know this adage, right? So much that it becomes a cliche. Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Does anyone know the second sentence? Normally doesn't make the cut. Great men are almost always bad men. That's the full quote, all right? Now, it sounds kind of depressing. It's not a comment about men. Everything I'm gonna tell you is true for regardless of gender. Um, but this idea of what's the relationship of being in a position of power and being bad or corrupt in some way? Well, it is not the case that we look at the science that being corrupt gives you an advantage to, to become great. But the other one does have a lot of support which is when one rises to a situation where one feels quite powerful, um, that they are more likely to behave in ways that we would describe as bad and corrupt. And one of the important things about this, this work is it's the feeling of power that actually makes the biggest difference. It's not the position that somebody's in. So you can think of people in your life who seem to act like they are in charge, even though you, for the life of you, you cannot figure out what they are in charge of. And you've, you've probably encountered other people who actually do have the authority or the resources to do something, and they say, oh, everything's out of my hands. What can I do? The feeling is actually what drives all these results, and that's why I think this stuff is really important because these are not things that only happen to people once they reach a certain position or title or level of a hierarchy. Every single one of us goes through our days feeling more in control and less in control at, other, at certain moments, and those things affect how we show up. So what happens with a sense of control when we start to feel powerful is it has an impact on our brain, specifically what is known as the behavioral inhibition system. There's a system in our brain we all have, and it is a good system. It keeps us out of trouble. Okay, the behavioral inhibition system says, if you have two paths you could pursue, you don't know which one is right, don't make a mistake. Don't do anything. Think about it. Right? Deliberate. Your behavioral inhibition system is what you should be thanking when someone cuts you off on the road and it doesn't end like this. Because you might have a moment of rage or anger, 
but you, it, go, it passes. And that's your inhibition system saying, there's multiple ways you could respond to this. Don't do anything for a moment. And in that moment, you have the sense to continue on about your day. Well, what happens when we feel powerful? When we feel powerful, that system is suppressed. It doesn't work as well. Because a competing system in our brain is activated. And that system is called the behavioral approach system. This is a good system too. The behavioral approach system says, do you see something out there that you want, right? Don't stop, don't think, just go get it. It controls a lot of our goal attainment and our achievement orientation. It's a good thing. But those two systems cannot be helping you at the same time. If the don't think, just run after what you want system is on, the sit back and think about it for a while system can't be working as well, and vice versa. So what we see happen in the brain is as soon as people start to feel that they are more in charge, more in control, the behavioral inhibition, inhibition system is suppressed, the behavioral approach system is activated, and the result of that is it leads people to pursue whatever they see as desirable with less deliberation and more impulsivity. So if you ever see somebody do something incredibly stupid and you ask yourself, what were they thinking? The answer to that is they were probably thinking nothing. There was an automaticity of behavior that is incomprehensible to you because you're not in that psychological state. But for them, when their behavioral approach system is activated, they're acting first and they're thinking and they're rationalizing second. So that effect on the brain leads to a lot of these behaviors. You see, the, beha you see the, the psychological effect on the left, you see the thing we can observe in life on the right. So I won't go through every single one of these, but examples, um, when we become more in control, uh, we have a, take a better view of ourselves. we become more overconfident that we're correct. They actually will give people opportunities to bet money on how right they're gonna be, answering trivia questions or predicting the future. And the powerful people lose more money because they're more um, confident to the point of being overconfident in their predictions. The other thing that happens as a result is we become, when we feel more powerful, more resistant to feedback, seeking it out and taking it. Because the definition of taking someone's advice has an implicit admission that their idea could be better than yours, right? If not, you would never take bad advice. But as we become overconfident that the way we see the world, the way things we believe are correct, which happens when, we're, when we feel powerful, we naturally become more resistant to the advice because it all seems wrong compared to what we think. So if you've ever taken that brave move and spoken truth to power, and essentially what you got back was some version of noted, right? That challenge is that the person receiving it can't really accept it because the overconfidence that their own beliefs are correct naturally causes them to disregard the feedback that they're given. We see more risk-taking, we see more negative authentic expression, particularly negative emotional outbursts, um, what you refer to as toxic leadership in psychology is often referred to as subordinate derogation, treating people below you poorly, um, and then reduced empathy, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second. But when you look at that list there, here's the important thing that I want to point out. Most of the things on that list do not make people criminals, but all of those things make people bad leaders. When you think about the retirement speech that someone is going to give for you one day, no one is interested in having these things mentioned, right? They were pretty overconfident, highly resistant to advice, a little bit tone deaf. This is not what we are going for, right? That's bad leadership. And so I think the biggest cautionary tale out of all this research in psychology is not that you would end up in a situation where you would commit an, you know, an ethical or, or legal offense, but that you would be a leader that nobody wanted to follow and you wouldn't even know it. So if I look at this idea of empathy and tone deaf, it turns out um, we, we can see these effects too. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your finger, uh, I'm going to have you put it to your forehead, and I want you to trace, as if you were drawing on your forehead, a capital letter E as in echo, okay? Trace a capital letter E on your forehead, and then when you've done it, you can just put your hand down. So there's two different ways you could have drawn that E, assuming you drew it right side up. You could draw it this way, or you could draw it this way. Now, when we look at these E's, right, we see the difference. One of them we can read. The other one is backwards to us, but it makes sense as you're looking out through your own forehead. 
This was one of several studies that shows that power turns people's attention toward the self and away from their environment. Why? Because attention goes where the rewards are. When other people have power over you, you need to pay a lot of attention to them because how they feel about you is critical to your success. When you are in charge, that information about how other people feel is just less important, so we don't pay as much attention to it. So the study was this. They had people just write about a time in their life where they had either had a lot of power or lacked power. And then they gave them a washable marker and they said, draw an E on your forehead. And what they found was that when people um, had thought about a time where they had been in charge and had more power, they were more likely to think about, well, how does the E look to me? They were more likely to draw the E in a way that made sense to them, like the guy with glasses, who's one of the co-authors, by the way. When people thought about a time when they didn't have power, they started to think about their audience. How would they see it? And they started to draw the E the way um, this guy here on the left is, who's another co-author who happened to be my office mate when, back when I was in graduate school. Um, so the idea here is that power changes where our attention goes. It makes us less able to recognize other people's emotions. We're just simply paying less attention to them. And it can make us show up in ways that make us seem like we are very tone deaf and not being able to read the room simply because it's turned our attention. All right, I'll skip Tiger, but Tiger's a perfect storm of... Um, uh, all of these kind of factors coming into play where a lot of pressures end up resulting in all kinds of um, challenging behaviors. Um, all right, so I have a couple pictures here. I'm not gonna, I won't explain every single one, but I'll give you a flavor of them. Um, in terms of how power can affect people, and, and I always say, right, um, that um, this undesirable behavior is much more problematic than unethical or, or illegal behavior. Undesirable is frequent, and it's hard to put your finger on. Illegal or unethical is generally pretty clear when you see it, and you know it and, it, and you know what to do about it. But these are examples of things I would describe as undesirable. They do not break any rules, but at the same time, they're not necessarily things we're going for, okay? So what I'm, gonna, I'm gonna move on. I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll, just, I'll just give you that one story here. But one of the things I want you to think about, right, is this idea of undesirable, things that do not break rules, um, but that we don't like. Actually. I changed my mind. I'll tell you the other story, too. Um, the, the picture of the person on the phone. That one's about me, even though that's obviously not me in the photo. Okay, because I, I think this is important. All right, so this, the deal is this. I'm in my office one day at work. My door's open. I'm talking on the phone to my husband. You can already tell from the story. We don't work together. So I am taking a personal call at work. Nothing, nothing wrong with that. But at that moment, a student who's in my negotiation course comes by unannounced without an appointment and knocks on my open door. He sees that I'm on the phone, and so I go like this, like I'm holding up, wait a second, and I'll be with you. I finish the conversation with my husband, and then I go out in the hall, he's there, he has a quick question, he asks me, and he's on his way. A few hours later, I'm on the phone again, another personal call, and this time my dean, who is the closest thing I have in my world to an actual boss, comes by my office unannounced and knocks on my door. Okay, I'm on the phone. What did I do? I gotta call you back. And that was an interesting moment for me to observe my own behavior. A lot of people will say to me, Allison, I get it, power changes people, but it doesn't change me. I mean, ask anyone who knew me in high school. I'm the same person I always was. See, power changes everybody. It does not make most of us criminals, but we are not the same person across these contexts. And here's the thing about that story. If those two incidents had not happened within hours of each other, and if I didn't study this kind of stuff for a living, I don't think I would have ever been aware that I was different in those two situations. Now, different doesn't mean bad, right? But here's the thing I want to impress upon you, right? The difference between a habit and a choice is your conscious awareness. I couldn't contemplate whether that was a good thing or not a good thing that I was doing, that difference between how people were getting access to me, until I first recognized that I was even doing it. And then, if I want to keep it, I can keep it. If I want to change it, I can change it. That's why I always say I'm very agnostic on what people do. But this idea that people understanding why they do what they do is the first step to deciding is there anything you don't like and you want to do, you want to do differently. Um, I'll mention this quickly. I'll put all these up here at once. The, I don't, you can read the long text on the left if it's interesting to you. Um, 
the long text is basically summaries of research findings in psychology that suggest that certain populations of people might be more at risk of having this powerful psychology affect them. Even though I said it can happen to everybody, there's certainly a risk of being more affected by these things as you rise, in part because you have fewer people to give you candid feedback. And candid feedback turns out to be really, really important for helping people see their own behavior through another lens, and when you don't get any of it, you are more inclined to think that everything you're doing is perfect. The other thing that I think is very relevant for this audience is we see that when people have a large step change in power, meaning they were, had very little control one day, and the next day something changes, and all of a sudden they have a lot more control, we see a lot of um, inappropriate behavior. In this particular study, they studied sexual harassment and sexual assault, and they found that regardless of the gender of the perpetrator or the victim, the biggest predictor was a step change in power. All right? I don't think that study is about sexual assault. I think that study is about um, any type of behavior that is seen as self-interested um, when people have a big change in power. So when people have a, a moment like that, right, when they are promoted, when they advance, they need more than a high five, right? They need support to recognize that person's psychology is going to change. And if there is nobody there to help talk them through that, some of them will end up doing things that cause them to derail. And then the other thing that we see is that when people who feel powerful feel threatened or insecure about their power, their respect, their competence, it turns out to be a really ugly combination. The best way to understand this is to, I'll tell you the title of one of the papers, when the boss feels inadequate. So when we have people whose power feels challenged, they are more likely to try to reclaim that power by acting in these ways that try to regain control. So, and then just to show you the far-reaching effects, okay, a couple things. Um, power turns out to change the way people speak. Even being assigned arbitrarily to a high power or a low power role changes people's voice in the following ways. And one of my absolute favorites, power leads you to overestimate your own height. All right, when people feel more powerful, they feel taller, okay, in all kinds of different ways. They'll have you, have you like go through a door and say, okay, you know that door is taller than you because you didn't hit it on the way in, but how much taller is it? The more powerful people feel, the more they think they're just like scraping by. Um, so there's all these psychological effects. Some um, can impact our leadership, others perhaps less so, um, but there are, there are many. All right, so at the risk of doing this, because no one's going to pay attention to me when the Homer Simpson is running around a hole, but it's going to stay like that. Um, this is another finding I wanted, I wanted you to understand. It's called the slippery slope of unethical behavior. The finding is this. When people do really bad things, they do not dig, dig themselves into those holes with backhoes. They do it with teaspoons. The research basically looked at, can you, commit, at, can you get people to commit really large transgressions? If you say to somebody, hey, want to steal this million dollars? Nobody takes you up on it. But if you say, hey, what about a penny? It's easy to justify a penny. They give those away for free, right, in, in, uh, you know, in some of those trays. Well, they, it turns out you can get people to steal a million dollars if you walk them up to it one penny at a time. And that was a slippery slope effect. What that means is that a lot of these behaviors that start off as just undesirable can be the thing that's the first teaspoon and the next teaspoon and the next teaspoon. And I see this all the time. Because I tend to see people in the military when they have reached the most senior ranks. And it has been happened more than once. On a day when I am speaking, I open you know, my news app on my phone for two minutes, and I see a story about senior leader misconduct in the military. It's the first time I'm hearing about it. And when I go to present and people are on the break, I can hear people processing and talking about it. Some people are hearing about it for the first time. Other people know who this person is, and they knew this was going to break, and they knew it was coming. And every single time I hear at least one person say, you know what, I'm not totally surprised. And then they go on to tell you a story that something shady that happened 20 years ago, but it wasn't anything that you could really put your finger on. It was just undesirable. And then story and story and story and story. So the undesirable things, right, if we can start to, as leaders, get a handle on those things, they are going to set us up for keeping ourselves and other people from digging the teaspoons until someone digs one teaspoon too many, 
and they end up right on the cover of some national news. So I'm going to give you three suggestions as I close here. I have two questions on the right-hand side. These are not questions I'm going to have you answer right at this moment, but they are questions I'm going to plant for you for you to think about as you go forward. In your time and observation of the Air Force, what behaviors have you seen that you would label undesirable? Meaning they do not break any rule that is written on paper, but you look at that and you say, that's not good. And then what would it take to eliminate or reduce those behaviors? That's one question. Second question is, who do you think that's around you that you think might be uniquely vulnerable? Right? Maybe it is somebody who is, or people who are recently you know, promoted or advanced. Who's particularly vulnerable and how can you reach those vulnerable populations and affect them positively and shape their behavior? Okay? Because one of the things I want to do today is to say, hey, this is the psychology of why this happens. When you see that person do that thing, the story that you tell yourself that they're just a bad egg and they're morally flawed in some way is actually not supported by any psychological research. Right? Most bad things are done by people of average moral character whose circumstances collided to produce really bad behavior. And so what that means is that we cannot create the organizations we want through selection alone. Right? We need culture, norms, processes to shape behavior, and people will do that if they know what's expected of them. So three things I'm going to say um, in, in closing. First, um, what helps? Accountability. So I gave this presentation once in the Air Force, and, and a woman raised her hand. She said, Allison, in the Air Force, we like to teach people to do the right thing when no one's looking. And I said, that is a great goal. I'm 100% supportive of it. But do you know what actually really works also? Looking. I said, think about the last time you were in a car, your personal car, you're driving. You don't think of yourself as a lawbreaker. And then you look in the rearview mirror and there's a cop behind you. Huh. I'm going to pay a little bit more attention to what I'm doing. Right? I shouldn't really be checking my phone just because I'm at a stop sign. I should have at least one hand on the wheel. All of these things. Accountability. So first... A lot of these things happen when people think no one's looking. So when we create the, the leadership in our area that we are paying attention, that is one important thing we can do as leaders. Second thing is we can set up for ourselves and set up for others mechanisms where people give and receive feedback. So there's a picture of a, a Subway sandwich there. I go to the Pentagon, invited to the Pentagon by a colonel to come talk to his group. Go in the, we're talking to the group about this stuff, but someone in the group says, we have a really good feedback culture here. I think here they meant the Pentagon or maybe the group, but no matter. What the colonel said next I thought was very telling. He said, I disagree. He said, let me tell you why. He said, I, I work here every day. Four days out of five, I eat Subway sandwich for lunch. I eat the sandwich, have my afternoon. I'll get home seven or eight o'clock at night. My first chance to basically go in the bathroom, have a moment of peace, wash my face. I look up, he goes, and I got spinach in my teeth. He said, I talked to 300 people since lunch, and not one person stopped me to say, sir, you have spinach in your teeth. And he said, that's not very hard feedback to give, right? It doesn't really threaten um, my integrity, my intelligence. You know, it, it, if they can't tell me I have spinach in my teeth, how would I realistically believe that they would tell me something that was really critical of what I was doing? So creating mechanisms where people feel safe to give and receive feedback ends up being also really, really important. And then the final one I'll say to you, is praise, okay? I love this quote by Ken Blanchard, catch people in the act of doing something right. right? We shape behavior not just by punishing people once we see them do something wrong, but by telling them I really like what you did and that was great, okay? In the NBA, teams that express appreciation for their players' moves, like you know, assists and points and stuff, through physicality, like fist bumps and chest bumps and high fives, those teams perform better. They win about two more games a season than teams who don't. It's about the difference between making the playoffs and not, okay? Now, do not go out of this room, give somebody a chest bump, and say, there was this speaker that told me to do that. That is not the point. The point is that when we tell people, right, that we appreciate them and we express that praise, um, that is just as motivating, more motivating than shaping behavior than oh, waiting until they've done something wrong and correcting them, okay? And I'll, I'll, I'll end with this. Feeling gratitude and not expressing it is like wrapping a present and not giving it. So the three things as you leave here I want you to think about is accountability, feedback, and praise. If I as a leader, as an individual, those things are costless. They don't require any position or title. Everyone can do them. If I can show up doing those three things, I will have done my part to influence people's psychology in a positive way that will help them show up and be their best selves. 
All right. So um, for people who like to read stuff, um, there are some books there if you want to take a look at them or snap a photo or whatever of things that you can read that are kind of on this topic. And then um, I, uh, on, a, on a different kind of angle, I have a book coming out in September. It's, it's written specifically for women, but on the topics of power and status, focused on essentially the opposite of what I'm talking about today. How do we get more of it? Because there's the challenge that happens when we have it. But for many people, they actually struggle to get it. They talk about the science of why that's harder for some groups rather than others. I do a lot of work using behavioral science to advance women. Um, that is coming out. It's not until September. Um, there is a QR code if you wanted to, um, to, to grab a signed copy, but the most important thing I want you to think about is that power is both something that we can, we can think about, that we have to guard against the negative effects, but it is a desirable thing for us to have, and we want to make sure we are also creating opportunities for everybody to have that power, and we know that it's harder for some groups than others. And then the final thing that I will say is this is how you could get in touch with me, okay? Um, my email is on there. That QR code is my LinkedIn. If you are on LinkedIn, I try to post on LinkedIn for things related to power, status, influence as much as I can. My kids call that my nerd social media, so you will not offend me if that is not your thing. Um, but my email is there as well, as long as my website. And what I would say is that if this sparks any questions, thoughts, or ideas for you, and we do not connect during the time that I am here today and tomorrow, I do hope that you will reach out one of the most gratifying um, experiences of the tw me doing this for 20 years on stage, day in and day out, is all the individual people I get to meet and follow up with as a result of doing these types of events. And so if I can ever be useful to you as you're thinking about something related to leadership, power, status, human behavior, negotiation, I hope that you will come find me and I would love to chat with you. So um, it has been a great pleasure to be here with you today and thank you very much. Dr. Fergill, thank you for your message this morning. At this time, we have time for one question. So if you want to make your way to the mic, we have time for one question. Uh, good morning. So my question is, um, and you named three ways to kind of help with that uh, behavior uh, with power and making sure that people don't, you know, dig themselves into a hole. Um, as always, there's those three methods, but do you have any more methods? Because it is known that not every method will work with everyone. And in psychology, there are always alternative ways to... Uh, you know, help. So do you have any other ways? Yeah, so when I think, when you think about what are we trying to achieve here, right, what you want for your, thinking about your own leadership and making sure that these things are not affecting you, we need good information. That can come from how you seek feedback, but can it also come from um, the people that you put around you that are going to be the ones who are going to be willing to t tell it to you like it is. Um, and for you to seek those things out. So that's one of the most important things for being able to look at yourself, is you can't change or even decide if you want to if you don't have the information. So setting up a good, a, a good environment for you to get the information. Um, and then the second thing in terms of shaping other people's behavior, right, um, is thinking about what are people rewarded for doing. Right? What do the reward systems look like? And rewards don't necessarily mean right, that you have something tangible to receive. Anytime I do something and I have a positive experience from it, I've been rewarded. Okay? So if I come into a meeting late and no one says anything, but being late allowed me to get my coffee, I have just been rewarded. Right? And so when we start to think about how we shape the cultures that we are in, what I want you to pay attention to is what behaviors are rewarding or self-rewarding and what behaviors are being criticized or discouraged. And when you start to look at that, you can compare that to, well, what do we want people to be doing? 
And every time we are rewarding a behavior that is something opposite of what we want, we are only creating the likelihood that that's going to continue. And by the way, because everyone is watching, as soon as we see one person do something that's rewarded, we start to think, oh, wait, I can do that too, right? I can be three minutes late um, because I can go get my coffee. And again, three minutes late is simply an undesirable behavior, and most people who are three minutes late won't, won't end up you know, on the front page of some national news journal, but they're likely to continue to be three minutes late, and then five, and then 10, and then maybe I just skip the meeting altogether, and then, oh, is there a call-in number? Um, so thinking about um, what behaviors are implicitly being rewarded in your environment is a really good place to start to say, am I setting up a culture that is going to encourage people to be their best selves? Great question. Thank you. Dr. Fergal, thank you again for your time today. Your vast knowledge on the psychology of power truly speaks to how we can embrace culture and empower people. On behalf of the U.S. Air Force Academy and our National Character and Leadership Symposium, please accept this token of our gratitude. The base of this gift is made out of marble from our terrazzo. This is significant because all cadets during their freshman year have to run the strips. We hope you will look on this and remember your NCLS experience fondly. This concludes our session. Please share your immediate feedback in the NCLS app. Select the session and click on the Rate Session button. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.